So over the last few weeks, we've been in this series, this short series called Said, Not Said. We've been looking at these ideas or things that people think Jesus may have said, and we've been unpacking each week why people may have wanted Jesus to say these certain things or affirm these ideas. And then we are looking and unpacking what Jesus actually said and why it is so important that he said what he said rather than what people think he said. Right? So far, we've taken on this idea that, that Jesus said, believe in yourself and anything is possible. This is something that people may think Jesus said. Come to find out, Jesus never said anything close to believe in yourself and anything is possible. And then last week, we considered this idea that Jesus said, go and do what makes you happy. Yeah, and we found out that Jesus never said that either. And today, we're going to end this series by figuring out what Jesus has to say about getting ahead in life. Like answering the question, how does it happen, Jesus? How do we get ahead? How many side hustles do I need to have to provide what I need in life? And we've been told since we were young that if we want to advance in life and be satisfied, somebody say satisfied. If we want to advance in life and be satisfied, that it will, because, it will be because we're strong or we're smart and more than anything because we work really hard. And that sounds maybe like something that Jesus might have said, right? So let's check out what the Bible actually says this morning. We're going to be reading in the Gospel of John, and our church has a tradition of standing for a Gospel reading. So if you just stand with me today as we read out of John chapter 6, starting in verse 22. The Word of God says, On the next day the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum, seeking Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For for on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, Then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your presence in this place this morning. I thank you, Lord, that you are working on our behalf right now. And that your promise is that where two or three are gathered, that you are there. You are with us right now, Lord. So we thank you. We ask that you open our hearts. We ask that you open our eyes to see you in a new way. Open our ears to hear you and our minds to reconsider all that we brought into today, holding on to. We give it all to you. We ask that you speak to us today. Start with me, Lord Jesus. Search my heart. Make me new. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. And I just want to welcome everyone joining us online also. We're so excited that we have an amazing online campus that joins us every week. So if you're joining us, uh, we welcome you. We're so glad that you're with us today. And before we jump into like the meat and potatoes, I have a really important question that I believe is extremely vital to everything that's going to happen today. Here's my question, and I need some responses from everyone. 
What is your favorite type of bread? Somebody, somebody hit me. What's your favorite type of bread? White, say it again. How, okay, what else? What else we got? So, ooh, what else, what else we got over here? Any, anybody over on the right side got a favorite bread? Garlic bread, okay. All right, we got some, we got some good, we got some, maybe you like that brioche bread, you know what I'm saying? That's kind of the hot ticket right now, brioche, you know? Maybe some of y'all like that garlic Texas toast. I know, that's pretty good, that's pretty good. Miguel, he likes the plain old Wonder Bread, plain old Wonder Bread. All right, now Lauren, my wife, my precious wife, her favorite bread is actually not even called a bread. It's French baguette. You got to say it with like the French accent, the baguette. That's how you got to say it. She likes French bread. But me personally, I'm with some of the, the more heavenly people in the room today, and I am all about that sourdough bread. Amen. Praise the Lord for the sourdough bread. This bread specifically is from Sono Bakery. This is heavenly sourdough bread. And when I think about this bread, mm, I think about slicing this puppy up right here and making some fire grilled cheese sandwiches. It gets me hyped. Praise the Lord for some grilled cheese sandwiches. Let's go. I might even have one later. Mm. And we have the luxury of getting to have a personal preference for what type of bread we like in these days that we live in. But back when this story that we just read took place, it wasn't that sweet. Bread was something that was extremely valuable and not everybody had all the time. Sometimes there would be bread shortages. Sometimes it was really, really hard to get bread. And this story that we read is all based around a chase for bread. Somebody say chasing bread. Chasing bread. Here's the scene. Do we have a picture? So Jesus had just blown everyone's mind by taking a small lunch with some bread and some fish donated by a young boy. And he takes that bread and that fish and he turns it into enough food to feed between 12 and 15,000 people. Pretty incredible. No one knew that this miracle was going to happen, but Jesus shows up on the scene. He does his thing. He breaks the bread, feeds everyone that healthy portion. The Bible says they ate until they were filled. And then Jesus gets in the boat and goes to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Now, the next day, all the people who had just experienced this, who got fed, showed back up at the same spot where the miracle happened, and they find out that Jesus had taken off and is now on the other side of the sea. So these people get in the boats that they had to go and find Jesus. Here's the scene, right? That's what's happening. But why are they willing to go through the trouble to get into the boats, to figure out where he is, all to go and find Jesus? Well, it's because he just did this whole wild miracle where everybody got fed, and in their minds, they're still trying to grasp what happened, and they want more of what Jesus is up to. They are chasing more bread. Then eventually, they find him. And here's what they ask him. In verse 25, they say to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? And this is where the Bible is kind of funny, right? Like, so, so the reason why it's funny is because they know when he got there. They were just with him the day before. They knew that they were with him the day before, late into the night. And so this is kind of like, I don't know if you, you've ever done this before. I have. But this is kind of like when you ask a question because you're really trying to cover up an ulterior motive of why you showed up. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm sneaking in, and, and it's really like, hey, Jesus, when'd you get here, bro? But really, like, they had another reason for being there, and Jesus knows this, right? And so he gets it, and he says one of the most important things that anyone ever has said before. But first, before he does that, he needs to sort of set up what's going on. And in verse 26, we can see that Jesus is kind of nailing down what's really happening with his people. He's going to say to them, pretty much like, you guys all showed up because you want me to do something for you. 
You, you want me to do something for you that you think is best for you. You've showed up because you want me to say something to you that you think is what you need to hear. And Jesus kind of just comes up on him and he's smooth and he just kind of hits him like this. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves, aka you're not showing up because you think I'm sent from God. You're showing up because you got to eat good yesterday and you're hoping that you can come here and hustle your way into some more food. You're out here chasing bread. Jesus is like, I know you worked really, really hard to get over here, but it wasn't because of who I am. It was really just because you thought that if you worked hard enough, I would feed you again. Verse 27, Jesus addresses them. He says, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. See, these people, they have shown some initiative. It was, it was good. They put in the hard work of getting in the boats, of figuring out Jesus' schedule and figuring out where he was. They made a journey across the sea to come to Jesus. They did everything that they thought was right in their little manuscript of how they were going to get fed. They worked really, really, really hard at getting there, and then they got to Jesus, and Jesus hits them with a, you're not working the right way. See, I think that they believed what people in our world today still believe. Here's something that I think people think Jesus said. God helps those who help themselves. This is something I've heard before. People often think, you find 100 people on the streets, and it wouldn't take too long for you to convince them that Jesus said God helps those who help themselves. Like, if you want to get ahead in life, if you want to be right with God and get God to love you, it's based on how hard you work, it's based on how good you are, it's based on how much you perform for him. If you want God to bless you, then it depends on how much you do for him. See, people often think, man, God is looking for that ambition, baby. You know what I'm saying? He wants me to be out here on my grind. He wants me to be on my hustle. That's what God's looking for. God will meet me halfway. I just got to do my part, and then he'll do his. Why? Because God helps those who helps themselves. So I'm just going to get in my boat and chase Jesus to the other side of the lake to get that bread because God helps those who help themselves. It sounds really good, right? There's some issues. But before we dive into the issues, I think that it's important for us to get a real glimpse into who these characters of the story are. It may be easy to judge people when you don't really know about them or their past or what their current circumstances are or their experiences. So I want to take a deeper dive into what these people in the story are like. So reading in the story, these people who came to him, they are not wealthy people. Some would say they live in poverty. These are people who likely gave up a whole day of earning wages to travel across the sea to chase this bread, to find Jesus. They are desperate. They live off the land. They don't have much. They live very difficult lives, y'all working and trying to get ahead so that they could put food on the tables for their family. This isn't paycheck to paycheck, all right? We think paycheck to paycheck is bad, but this is worse than paycheck to paycheck. These people don't even know where the next paycheck is coming from. And if everything doesn't work out just right, they're not going to have enough food for their family to eat dinner that night. So I get why they may think that God only helps those who help themselves. Remember, this is right after Jesus just fed all these people miraculously. So Jesus is aware of who they are, and he's aware of their needs. But here we see Jesus responding to a group of people who are desperate for nourishment on the heels of a major feeding miracle. They've shown up hungry, desperate, and hopeful. They are on their grind. They are chasing the bread. They are trying to do everything possible to make sure that they are going to be okay because I want you to feel this today. I really want you to because I believe that there are some people in this room who have showed up today desperate, hungry, and hopeful. And there are some people here in this room who have come to believe deep within them that God only helps those who help themselves. 
See, they think it's their job to provide everything for themselves. It's their job to make sure that they have everything taken care of and under control in order for them to make it. And Jesus, in this story, just happens to be the flavor of the day. Like, he's got that new, good, sourdough bread. We're going to call this a get bread quick scheme. They're out here just trying to hustle, trying to chase down Jesus, because last week they hustled and fed their family because they put in an extra 20 hours of work and just had enough to get the good bread from the market. The week, two weeks before that, they were able to sell off some extra fish, maybe a couple household appliances that they had, and then they got by and they fed their family, and this week it's just Jesus time. It's that get bread quick scheme, and this is where the rat race has brought me today. They think that if it's going to happen, it's all on me. And so I'm rolling the dice on Jesus today. Can you feel this moment? I know I can. I can feel this moment. And, and, and the reason why I say it is because I know what it feels like to carry the entire weight of the world on my shoulders and think that if I'm going to get by and if my family is going to get by, that, that all I have to do is just work harder, that I have to just try a little bit harder, that I need to just get on my grind and hustle and make it happen no matter what it takes. Like, who am I hurting anyway other than myself? By working harder than I've ever worked and doing more than I've ever done. What else am I going to do? And I know what it's like to feel the despair of knowing that no matter how hard I try, I can't do it on my own. And that no matter how hard I work, I still come up short. The truth is that I come up short in life in providing everything I actually need, everything my family needs. And I come up short in my relationship with God trying to convince him to love me on my terms, thinking that my ability to do everything right and be perfect and have everything on my to-do list checked off is what will earn his love. I believe that we often fail to live up to the expectations we set for ourselves because all my work, all my effort, it still comes short. And listen, God isn't opposed to us working. I want you to hear that today. Don't, don't, don't leave here thinking, oh, well, God doesn't want me to work. No, 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 no. God wants us to work. We were literally created to work for God's pleasure. Did you know that? We were created in the image and the likeness of God. It is part of our design. We were formed for purpose. Get that today. But Jesus is lasered in on how we can get to this place I don't know if somebody's with me right now, but we can get to this place where we think our ability to work or produce is what we mistakenly rely on to get ahead in life. Jesus knows how easy it can be for us to take something good that God created for us and then decide to worship that thing instead of the one who created it. Jesus sees what they are working for and how they are working for it. And he responds to them in verse 27. He says, do not work for the food that perishes. Get this, Jesus never said, God helps those who help themselves. I need you to hear me this morning. Jesus never said anything close to that. Jesus never even hinted that those who find satisfaction and fulfillment in life find it because they are smart enough or that they try hard enough or that they are talented enough or exercise their independence or autonomy enough. Jesus doesn't support the rat race. Jesus isn't going to confirm the value of the hustle culture. He says, don't work for what doesn't last. Don't work for what ultimately won't satisfy you, but work for what really matters. I hear it right now. Jesus is saying, I know you think that working really, really, really hard to grind and hustle and get ahead is what you think is going to be the keys to success and fulfillment and good things and favor with me. But here's the reality. God doesn't help those who help themselves. God helps those who choose the one who God has chosen. Yeah, you can give God praise for that. 
He says, for on him God the Father has set his seal. Don't work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life. Jesus is talking about himself, and he says, I am the one that you really want to come after, and the reason you know it's true is because God has set his seal on me. In other words, you've all shown up in this moment right now because you think I can do some cool tricks and conjure up some food out of nowhere. Y'all are chasing bread. You're here because of yesterday's miracle, but listen, yesterday's miracle happened so that you could just get your eyes locked into what really matters. And I think that in 2023, in the American church, we often chase after signs. We chase miracles. We get wowed and we chase after emotional goosebump experiences in worship. And we love to tell stories about how God has provided miraculously for us out of nowhere. And listen, I love the signs that God does. I believe that he works miracles. I love the wonders of how God works. And I love feeling the goosebumps in worship. And I love when God shows up and miraculously provides supernaturally out of nowhere. I love that our Heavenly Father is faithful and provides for his children, but all of that is secondary to what God is really trying to do in our lives. Write this down if you're taking notes today. What matters is not just what Jesus can do for you. What matters is who Jesus is. That's what matters. The people we read about in this story are just like us. We're just like them. We got a lot in common. They heard Jesus say, don't work that way. Don't work for those things. Work this way. Work for this one thing. And all they heard was work. See, we got work on our minds. Be like, work, 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 work. That's how we think. We're like, we just got to get it in. We just got to get on our grind, right? We just out here putting in this work. We've been convinced that what it takes in America to make it is independence. Hear me. We've made an idol out of independence in our country. We've taken a good thing like independence, and we've turned it into an ultimate thing. We've turned it into an idol. We've been deceived by the fallacy of autonomy. And if all that really matters in my life is my independence and my autonomy, then the only reason Jesus matters is because of what he can do for me. Jesus is saying, don't seek the signs, seek me. Don't work for the bread of this world. Don't work for what doesn't last, work for what lasts. And all they heard was work. Look how they respond in verse 28. They said to him, what must we do, Jesus, to be doing the works of God? And I think this is how often we live. Do, doing, works, stuck, chasing, bread. They're like, okay, Jesus, in regards to all that you just said, I still need to know one thing. I still need to know, how can I work in order to get this bread? They are convinced that God helps those who helps themselves. And this is when I believe this emoji was invented. The palm in the face emoji. Jesus is like, Jesus hits him with the palm in the face. He's like, y'all aren't getting it. So let me just try to share this with you again. I know y'all are fixated on work and working, and you think that that's the solution. So let me explain how God works. Verse 29, Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. People of Broad River Church, hear me today. This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. This is the work of God. Believe in him whom he, has, whom he has sent. And I can already hear the voices, the voices coming up, the questioning. But God, I need to make sure that I do everything correct in my life, right, and get good grades in school, right, so that I can get into the right college, right, so that I can take out the student loans, right, so that I can get the master's degree, right, so that I can have a good paying job, right, so that then I can find the perfect spouse, right, so that then we can have kids, right, and then I can have a 401k, right, and a really nice car, right, and then a mortgage with a house, right, so that I can retire one day in Florida and not have to work or worry about anything, right, God, this is how you're going to bless my life, right? God, 
to help myself so that you will help me in the future. Right, God? Man, I think that this is what we believed ever since we were little. That we have to work and work and work and work and work. And that's the only way that we'll get ahead in life. But Jesus says, all that stuff is fine. Listen, Jesus is not saying, don't do any of those things. Some of those things are really good. But what is really important, what the real work of God is, is that you believe in him. Jesus is saying to them that the bread that I provided for you yesterday was just to make you consider me. And everything I'm sharing with you today, hear my heart today, is about one thing. It's about helping us break out of an old mindset and repent. You remember from last week what repent means. It means return, pent, higher things. I'm placing before each and every one of us an opportunity today to turn around, look up, and fix your eyes on Jesus. We're walking through these verses today, verse by verse. Why? Because these are the verses that every human being who has ever lived is experiencing. These verses describe what your week has been like this week and what your week will be like next week. The question in front of these people is the same question that will be asked of everyone here today for the rest of your lives. Here's the question. Where will the focus of your life be? Where will it be? Jesus has been as clear as he can be to them. He's saying, I'm the one. He's saying, I'm, I'm him. Jesus is saying, I'm the one who matters. So they have to have got it now, right? They have to have understood. And in verse 30, they reply back to Jesus, and again, they say to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? They're like, oh, okay, you claim you're the one, Jesus. Okay, what can you do for us then? We're on our hustle here. We're here to get that bread, boy. How, how, how many tricks can you do, Jesus? Can you do another lunch trick, Jesus? That was sweet. Provide for us the sourdough bread again, Jesus. What can you do for us that our fathers didn't do for us, Jesus? They go into verse 31, and they say, Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. They're like doing this comparison thing. They're like, okay, Jesus, I know, I know you did the loaves and the fish thing yesterday, but back in the day, Uncle Moses Man, he provided for us by having bread just out on the floor in the ground so we could just walk out and there would just be bread everywhere, Jesus. He gave us that good bread. Every day was there, Jesus. Can you do that one, Jesus? Can you? Jesus, let me, let me ask you real quick, Jesus. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Jesus, can you provide the pumpernickel bread from Outback? With the honey butter on the side, you know what I'm saying, Jesus? Can you, can you do that one? Right? How about the baguette? How about baguette, Jesus? Can you provide baguette? What about a croissant? You know I like my croissants, Jesus. They're missing the picture. They're missing it still. Still set on what and how Jesus can provide for them. They miss it. They're like, can you hook it up like Uncle Moses did, Jesus? And I know it's kind of funny, and we laugh, and it kind of de-escalates the tension in the room. But I'll admit that there have been times where I've been guilty of focusing way too much on what Jesus can do for me and not nearly enough on who Jesus is. I'll be the first to admit it. Like, what's in it for me, Jesus? Man, I've been working all this time. I've been doing everything right. I've been doing everything you told me to do. When are you going to hook me up, Jesus? When am I going to get the blessings? When do I get the benefits? Can't you get me the honey butter, Jesus? You know I want that honey butter. And man, I'm so grateful that God is gracious and kind, and he doesn't respond to us with anger or wrath when we're stuck in self-centeredness. Anybody else grateful for God that he is gracious to us, even when we're self-centered? Yeah. And he overlooks their self. Look at how he, he gently corrects these people in, in, verse 20, in verse 32. He says to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the bread from heaven. So he's like, wait, wait a second. You think Moses did the whole manna thing? Hold up. Now, 
In fact, Moses didn't have anything to do with that manna thing. Moses didn't work for that manna. Moses was just as surprised as anyone and everyone else when that manna showed up. Jesus is like, y'all think that was Moses who did that? And man, I feel this at the deepest level because anytime somebody wants to try to give me credit for all the good things that have happened in my life over the last years, I'm thinking to myself like, wait, you think I'm doing this? What? You think I'm responsible for all the good stuff that has happened over the years? If you only knew, y'all think I just one day figured it all out and woke up one morning and started doing all the right things and working really, really hard and all of a sudden, Lauren walked right back into my life and it was all because God just helps those who help themselves and I help myself. No way! I'm sorry. It didn't happen that way. There is absolutely no way that I could ever take credit for the life that I have today. I didn't do it. I didn't work hard enough for it. I didn't earn it. I don't even deserve it. It's all Jesus. All of it. All of it. It's all him. And that goes for all of you, too. Man. I need you to hear this say. The Apostle James, he says it this way in James 1 7. He says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Everything is from above. God wants us to know that the good things in our life didn't come from anything we did. I need you to get this because we will never be enough on our own. See, Nike wants you to believe that you can do it, that's what they want you to believe. But Jesus is saying, you didn't do it. Every good gift comes from above. Write this down if you're taking notes. There is great despair that results from coming face to face with the reality that we will never be enough on our own. There is. But there is a great comfort and peace in understanding that Jesus is our source and sustainer. He is our source and our sustainer. And Jesus says to them in verse 33, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus is saying, what really matters is not what I have or what I can do. What matters is not the miracle I did yesterday or the miracle that I'm going to do later. What matters is me. What matters is not just what Jesus can do for you. What matters most is who Jesus is. And only when you really grasp this reality can you begin to understand fully what he can really do for you, how much he can provide for you, how much he can completely transform your life. I'm here this morning to confront you with the reality of what matters more than anything else, and that is the person of Jesus Christ the one that God has placed his seal on, the one who came and gave his life for you. And he is saying to someone here today, I know you feel like in order for you to get ahead in life and to be satisfied and fulfilled that you need to just work harder or be smarter and get everything right. I know that you're carrying this weight. I know you're trying to make it all work out. I know how many plates that you have spinning all at once, and you're just trying to keep every plate spinning and spinning, and you have all these hands everywhere just trying to maintain and keep everything up all the time. And I know how much fear you have that if you just let go of one thing, that everything will come crashing down. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to feel the weight of the world and to feel like if I don't just do everything and work hard enough, then I'm just going to disappoint everyone. I know what that's like. And I know that you're tired. I know that you're weak and you're weary, but I'm here to tell you today that that isn't the life that Jesus wants for you. Life isn't about producing what you can. It's not all about that. It's not all about how much you can do. It's not about how much you can produce. It's not about doing everything right. It's not about how much or how hard you can work. And I know you've been searching and searching and chasing, but here's what really matters. Verse 35, Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus is saying to them, I am what you've been searching for this whole time. All the striving, it's been me all along. All the work, all the searching. I am the bread you've been looking for. I don't know who this is for today. God put this on my heart to share with you guys. And we can work really, really, really hard and make all the right moves and do all the right things and get baskets and baskets and baskets and barns and houses of this bread. We can do a lot to get this bread. Endless supplies of food. We could have all the bread in the world, mountains of it, but we will always get hungry again. We will always get hungry again. No matter how much we eat, no matter how many things we acquire, we will always want and be in need of more. And the reason why is that nothing in this world can really satisfy us. And I know because I've tried. Hear me today, I've tried everything. I've searched the world. I've searched the, the pleasures of the world and the philosophies of the world, the positions of the world. Nothing has ever filled me. I couldn't eat enough. I couldn't drink enough. I couldn't smoke enough or have enough sex. I couldn't work enough or perform enough or earn enough. There was always something missing. Until Jesus... I'm here to say to you today, until Jesus, nothing of this world ever filled me up until I met that man named Jesus. And everything changed. He was the only one who filled me. He's the only one who could ever satisfy that need that I have, that deep, deep desire that I have. I found the bread I was always chasing after. And it was Jesus. And he says that those who come to him will never be hungry. And whoever believes in him will never thirst. So I'm pleading with you today. Will you continue to choose to help yourself? Because you believe that God helps those who help themselves. Will you keep trying to fill yourself with all the things of this world? Will you keep chasing bread? Or will you believe in the one whom God sent and come to Jesus, the bread of life, the only one who can fulfill all of our needs and our wants? Will you come to Jesus today? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this moment in this place today. We thank you for a divine appointment with you in your presence right now, Father God. And we as your people, Lord, we humbly just repent, Father God. We turn back to you. We know the error of our ways that we've so often thought that, that it was about all that we could do or we could work and how hard we tried. And that was what earned your approval and your blessings. So we just repent from that way of thinking today. We shift our mind back to you and we put our eyes on Jesus, the true bread of life the one who can fulfill all of our needs and desires. We put our trust in you, Jesus. We ask, Father, that you would fill us today. Help us to not rely on ourselves, but to look to you as the source and the provider of everything that we need. We're going to put our faith in you today, Jesus, because we know that you are providing for us and that in you there is no lack. And there may be some people in here today who would say that they've been chasing after things of this world, that they've been chasing bread for a long time, and that nothing is working. And I want to just invite you today to come to Jesus, the bread of life, to just take a next step in your faith and to decide 
to give your life to Christ, to come to him and to believe in the one whom the Father sent, and that is our Lord Jesus. I want to invite you to take a fresh start with God today. So if that's you and you want to come to Jesus today, you want to turn away from the things of this world and you want to come to Jesus, I would love to pray a prayer with you. It's a salvation prayer. And I'd love to know who I'm praying with today. So if that's you today and you want to pray this prayer and come to Jesus for the first time or for the first time in a long time, I'd love for you to just shoot up your hand in this place right now. Just shoot up your hand in this place right now. Thank you for these hands that are here right now. Thank you for these hands. Church, let's just pray with anybody who raised their hand today and who wants to come to Jesus. Let's all pray together to say, Lord Jesus, thank you for coming for me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for the new life I have in you. Lord, I turn my heart to you today. I turn away from the things of this world and I come to you, Jesus. I give my life to you. I surrender it all. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, church. Why don't we stand together and celebrate?